Hello everyone and welcome to the Desolation Sounds podcast. Welcome back to the Desolation Sounds podcast. It's been a while. It has been a while. Not unless you're new here, at which point, you know, this is the first time here, so you've got no context for everything. But for everyone else who's been here for the past few weeks, it has been a while. Y'all know how it is. Life gets in the way. you got to take a couple weeks off. But I'm feeling refreshed. I'm ready to be back. I missed you all mildly. And I'm sure you all miss me mildly as well. If this is your first time here, or because it's been such a gravitous long time, you might have forgotten. The Desolation... Oh, well, first of all, my name is Stephen Hook, and the Desolation Podcast is a podcast celebrating everything to do within the world of alternative music. Be that rock, punk, metal, or extreme metal. Oh, it is. That's weird saying that again. It's fun, though. I'm having a great time already. I'm sure you are, too. Now, usually, if you are new, or if you have forgotten, usually we run down a like thing of the week's news, sort of like give commentary, talk about new music that's out. It's all a lot, a lot of fun. It's all a great happening time. And then we review some albums and a classic album or album that I feel like has been forgotten by the annals of time. And then we we fuck off and do it all the following week because of my accidental hiatus and i hate that word more than anything in the world um we are going to do things a little bit differently we're going to get four albums from four different decades and just give them a review and what they kind of mean to me because accidentally they're four albums that i've grown up with quite a bit and i enjoy a lot for different reasons um normal programming will resume next week and we'll talk about at the end the albums you can look forward to next week but like i said we're going to jump straight into it we're going to look at first from the 80s it is kings of metal it is a sixth album from new york power metal titans man of war um uh, man of war despite all their recent controversies of which they are animals man of war are one of the most important bands for me as like a fan of music now, 2007 album Gods of War was the album that got me into niche metal. I can't remember if I talked about it before, but basically, um, we were about to get in the car and my parents picked up the CD because my, step, my stepdad is the Man of War fan, or was the biggest Man of War fan in our house. He introduced him to me. About to get in the car, I went to go back and get the album, and I had heard him like play test it in the house and i just heard the opening song which is like this big orchestral classical music thing and i thought oh boo we're gonna have to listen to classical music because i am how was i then 13 and violins were for suckers um my mum bless her describes it as no man of war one of the biggest gothic metal bands in the world mum well i was about to say mum doesn't know much about music mum reviews music so she knows more than i do um, but we put the album on, and Gods of War was like the gateway to power metal, would end up becoming speed metal, thrash metal, I don't know, death metal, black metal, metal, the whole thing. It all started with Man of War, and they were one of the few bands that I've actually gone back to and sort of like rev- like revised their back catalogue. And that's why, well, that's what's led me to Kings of Metal, one of, I think it's actually. Easy to say, Man of War's most lucrative album across their entire discography, which we'll touch on a little bit in a second. Um, but overall, as much as I love Man of War, and they will forever hold a special place in my tiny little heart, outside of recent controversies, of course, don't condone that at all, don't put words in my mouth, they are one of the cringiest bands to exist. They are, I've described them as uber heavy metal because they take this shit just so seriously. You know, um, they, I think it's on, I think it was the album just before this actually. Was it Fighting the World? It was. On Fighting the World, they are drawn as to have just like being loincloths and ripped abs and that sort of thing. Into Glory Ride, which was their second album, they are, it is, instead of an artistic representation of them, it is literally them in loincloths and fucking bare 
skin and all that sort of shit. They and they live by that. Modern day Man of War. I've seen like loads of live videos of them, and I used to have a live DVD. Um, they are in leather trousers, leather vests. Uh, it's all very. I don't even know what it's nowadays. It's very like borderline dominatrixy, um, which is hilarious because Eric Adams, lead singer, can pull that off because he's fucking huge. He is just ripped. Um, the DVD I had, which was their like Magic Circle Festival from years ago. Excuse me. Um, the drummer at the time, Scott Columbus, was also a big guy, so. He suited the whole leather on leather thing quite well as well. Their guitarist at the time, Carl Logan, and their then and still current bassist, Joey DeMaio, quite small fellas in comparison. Like, Joey, any other person next to him would look like a big guy, but compared to Eric and Scott, bit on the bit on the shrinky-dinky side, and then Carl Logan was just always a very skinny man, very pale Long haired ginger, always looks straightened hair man who is a bad person but looked ridiculous, even more ridiculous in leather trousers. But there we are. Um, in terms of like the grand scheme of things, what else like ludicrous cringe? Kings of Mel is pretty top tier, um, musically as well. In Man of War's uh, discography, this is also pretty top tier. Um, it's still a mad bag and an assortment of sounds and ideas. You know, the song, but the album opens with the song Wheels of Fire. And that in itself opens with the revving of like a really throaty American, like Harley Davidson style motorbike. Because although with Manowar, you do get often transported to the world of fantasy, mythology, and Vikings and axes and more loincloths. Um, you are still under the giant thumb of the United States of America. You know? Um, the song itself, the rest of the song, as ludicrous as it is, is still brilliant. It goes full thrash metal, which I was thinking about it. Pretty much one, at least one song per manual album does go that full thrash metal sort of thing like for the gods of war album i was thinking about it um e oh, that's a few there's a few ones that could go for it but for me it would be king of kings that sort of like it just goes hard with the like, double kick drums uh guitarist and, ba and joey do like keep up in terms of like beat for beat and yeah it's all a jolly good time on this album it was wheels of fire very it is just is it tremolo when it's just like up and like up and down the strings? Tremolo picking, double kick basing, a lot of snare, and that's Wheels of Fire. But it's fucking great. Um, the the whammy the whammy dies on the solo as well do give it that the right levels of sinisterness about the song and about the album. And yes, yeah, so that is like the one half of Man War, the red blooded American heavy fucking metal, almost parody like band you know like other examples of that on this album with the, the title track kings of metal it's it's really really corny um it's all about being oppressed for listening to heavy metal like as the chorus goes they want to keep us down but they can laugh when we get up. We're going to kick their ass. Like, oh, if, oh I got a shiver down my spine just saying it. And yeah, it's all about Manowar being the biggest band in the world. And then, like, yeah, if you are listening to heavy metal, especially Manowar, you're cooler than everyone else. And I imagine, well, I don't imagine. I have it on good authority because admit I wasn't there. But listening to heavy metal back in the 80s, probably was more taboo and you probably did get looked down a lot more than you do now like i had it growing up i'm sure a lot of people did growing, um growing up listen to alternative music but i don't know if it's just because i'm older and i'm around adults or if it's just something that's died altogether 
but I don't really see a lot of people getting shit for listening to heavy metal or any form of alternative music. There's still a gap in, I was going to say representation, but I think that's too big of a word. But like, you know, mainstream music still won't cover alternative music all that much. Um, Scuzz is dead. Krang was dying. Apparently Krang's doing a lot better now. Um, rock sound is just diabolical. Um, but yeah. Back then, I imagine it was a lot bigger of an issue. So the song itself hasn't probably aged well, but it was the 80s. Not much has aged well from the 80s. Um, so yeah, that's the one side of Red Blood in America. And then you've got like the Fantasy Sword Warriors Honor Odin Malarkey sort of shenanigans. Um, and that's like the bulk of most of their albums. Um, Hail and Kill. Hail and Kill could have been like from this because this is, this is the 80s. Um, a lot of the metal bands back then had their one hit wonder that people still know them for. Like, um, Poison. Now they got a couple, but a lot of people associate them with Every Rose Has Its Thorn. Um, Motley Crue, Acid. Like, although they got massive, you ask, like, the. I think they were more than. No, they were definitely 80s. Ask, like, a generic music fan, the probably go to would be Girls, Girls, Girls. Um, pour Some Sugar On Me by Def Leppard. Def Leppard? Yeah, why did I think I had that wrong? For some reason I thought it was Le the Dead Skinned. Def Skinned. Oh well. Um, but yeah, you know what I mean? It's like one song per band from back then. It exploded, made them like mildly famous at the time. And then they just sort of like occupy propaganda playlists until the end of time. And Hail and Kill could have been that song. It's a fucking great song. It is just mad by one or two questionable lyrics, which I don't want to say out loud because I don't want my, I don't want me saying that out loud on the internet. But yeah, Google the lyrics. You will immediately find the lyrics I'm talking about. Otherwise, yeah, I think that Hail and Kill could have been the song for Man of War. Um, fortunately, it wasn't. Uh, Kingdom Come reasserts a whole like fantasy honest thing because you've got like battle drums in there you've got like a big i was gonna put gang vocal but because it's man of war it's more like a warrior tribe kind of vocal and it's just all up in there and it's very like hail and metal and vikingy and then blood of the kings i can't actually fall i fucking love that song it's so good plus england gets a shower on it you know, any song from outside of England that says, yeah, England, I'm all about that. I'm all about that because apparently I'm a nationalist, I think. Is that the right word? I don't know. Um, even when they do, do try to go a little bit emotional, a little bit doe-eyed and that kind of thing, the lyrics are very, still very Harry Chess, Battle Swords-like. Um... My key example here is Heart of Steel. It's a big piano-y, like, discount meatloaf kind of deal. There's a child screaming outside. Don't tell Carl. Um, and it's all about, like, not giving up and being true to yourself. And it even... It, the, but the... Ah, the lyrics are just so milady fedora. It's unreal. Like, they'll watch us rise with fire in our eyes. They'll bow their heads, their hearts will hang low, then we'll laugh, and they will kneel, because they know this heart of steel. Oh, it's just awful. It is so bad. It's so fucking terrible. Um, but it's cheesy fun. This, I, this album and the band and the style of music like power metal is just so incredibly cheesy like i don't care how serious they take themselves and i don't i fucking love power metal don't get this wrong rhapsody of fire i know they're slightly different but they are one of my favorite bands of all time like i'll happily uh 
Jam, some Blind Guardian, some Halloween, even a little bit of Gamma Ray here and there. I fucking love Power Metal. It's just been so long since a new band did it well. I think the closest anyone got was, there was Destrophy, which had one song that was good. And people called Blessed by a Broken Heart Power Metal for a while, and they're not. They are very bad glam metal. Awful glam metal. A glam rock. We don't even give them the moniker of Mechel. This is Man of War we're talking about, kind of. And, but yeah, like the whole genre, Man of War, the band, the album at all, it's just ludicrous, but it's so much fun. Like, it's like you're watching your soaps or a B-horror movie. You know it's going to be bad. You know it's going to be the shittest thing you'll ever experience. But you don't care. It's ludicrous. It's fun. And yeah, it just... It, excuse me. It kills a bit of time. You know? Um, Eric Adams, the lead singer. Still remains one of my favourite vocalists of all time. He can hold crystal clear, really engaging powerful notes i think it's something daft like 45 seconds which is an incredibly long time like good god damn dude uh and he's quite verse nah, I, yeah i'm gonna say it. he's quite versatile with his sound um in kings of Metal, he does add up with whomever who's who does production on this album uh, Man of War themselves, fucking great. And Jason Flom, what a name. They put a lot of effects on Eric's vocals. Like a lot of, um, I don't want to say auto-tune, but it's um, like a reverb, I guess, kind of thing. And it, I suppose it's meant to add to the mystique and the mood of the album. Ooh, spooky. But it's kind of shit. He sound he's a phenomenal vocalist. Let him sing. You know, it's just it's a it's a bit dafty. It's very dafty, in fact. Uh, the bassist. <laughs> I really like the point that I made here. Bassist Joey DeMaio. I think that's how he pronounce his last name, by the way. Joey DeMaio. DeMaio. D E M A I O. Joey DeMaio. Sure. I remember when I was growing up, I thought his name was Joey DiMaggio. He's something, He's someone completely different. Joey DiMaggio was the OG Pete Wentz. Which is a fucking great statement I've ever made. Um, he tries to be the figurehead of the band. And I guess to a point he is. Like He does all the announcements. He does all the um, press release stuff for the band. Um... He tried to be the figurehead of Man of War, but he's forgotten that he's just a bassist, which is a, musically, anyone who's actually a bassist, I know I've just shat all over your biscuits, but the history of music dictates that no one ever likes the bassist. Um, the only example I can think of where that's not true is in All American Rejects, because the lead singer is the lead singer who happens to also be the bassist. If he was just the bassist, people would think, oh man, he's got a cool jawline. Move on. You know, it's a sad state fair, but no one gives a shit about bassists. He's a very good bassist. Like, he... It's, it's a... It's a... You go into any um, like live video of Man War, he'll do a fucking bass solo make it sound fucking cool and then he'll end it by snapping all the strings which must really fucking annoy that guitar tech but no one wants to hear a three minute long bass solo of your interpretation of flight of the bumblebee no one wants that i don't want that i thought i did and then i grew up by like 12 months and i'm like oh fuck me this is boring you know it reminded me of the Two and a Half Men joke when Charlie lived next to Stephen Tyler from Aerosmith and he's like playing the harmonica. And he goes, they pay, they pay to watch you sing, they tolerate the harmonica. 
this is it's a very similar thing they pay to watch Met uh, metallica fucking hell i'm lost they pay to watch man or they tolerate the bass solos um for Man of War, Kings of Metal can act as like a greatest hits for the band. Um, a lot of songs are still live staples. They are still incredibly popular, popular, popular with the Man of War fan base, which is predominantly in mainland Europe. Like they do a lot of tours in mainland Europe. I don't know. They barely. They. I think they've come to England once in the past like eight years. Um. And I don't even really see them announce tours for America all that much. They have, like, Germany, Italy, France, all pop them so fucking hard. It's quite weird. Um, but Kings of Metal acts as, like, a great hit for them. I think, I, I'm fairly certain a lot of the songs in here are still live staples. Like, they I still think they end all their shows with The Crown and the Ring, uh, Lament of the Kings. Like, that is, as they're, like, Closing down, they'll go off and wave, and it's playing over the PA. They walk off, and people will still sing back like the lyrics on mass. Uh, and then you've got songs like the title track Kings of Metal, Hail and Kill, Wheels of Fire. I think they are still played live on the reg. Um, I want to forget Pleasures That Exists because you should too. I had to listen to that song with my stepdad once, it was incredibly awkward. Listen to it, find out, and then exit out your head because you won't be able to. But I want other people to suffer. I think Man of War are big enough that you will already have heard of them or listen to them if you are a fan of Power Metal. So, because the only bands I can really think of to compare them to are their contemporaries. So Iced Earth, Halloween, Hammerfall. They have a bit more of like a heavy metal edge to them. Iced Earth especially because they are... I think Iced Earth are American. But they have like a more American sound to them either way. Whereas Halloween and Hammerfall, they're definitely more on like the European side of Power Metal. Um, Ice Death have that like American groove to them, same way that uh, Man of War do. So yeah, if you like Halloween, like Ice Death, and you like Hammerfall, but you still have not checked out Man of War. Um, Kings Metal, I think, are, is, excuse me, the best place to start for Man of War. I know I started with God's War, but in the grand scheme of things, God's War is quite different because it is more of a symphonic power metal, power metal album. Just steer well clear because they haven't done much since. They've made, released one full album, which was The Lord of Steel, which I got the like Hammer edition, which came free with an issue of Metal Hammer. And it's shit because the production on it sounds like absolute garbage. I have never, I've never gone back to listen to the remastered version, but stay clear of anything that's got Roman numerals next to it because they re-released Battle Hymns and Kings of Metal for like what was that twenty six and twenty four? Was that just two thousand? Oh, fuck you. Um, I'm intrigued actually because it's got, it's got, uh, that's two thousand. It's two thousand eleven. I'm confused. Either way, they've got they re-released Battle Hymns and Kings of Metal for um, well, they fully re-recorded them, and they are awful. Like this, they bring the speed down so much. It's it's very like slow paced in comparison to the OG recordings. And it's got the same sort of production as Lord of Steel, which was AIDS. Oh, it's just bad. They just just don't go near them. Stick to pretty much anything without, but well, all the things without a Roman numeral, and they're not Lord of Steel. And everything else, you can find at least three, four good songs that you you be movie horror. You ignore how bad it is, and you just accept what it is. Um, but yeah, that was Kings of Metal by Man of War. Still remains annoyingly one of my favourite albums ever because it's it's ludicrous and I don't care. I just do not care. Right then, on to something quite very different. We are going... It's a new decade, but only going forward by two years. We're going to 1990 
and it is the debut album of Green Day. The uh, so I don't need to introduce Green Day. Everyone knows who Green Day is. Uh, the album was called Thirty Nine Smooth or Thirty Nine and or Smooth. It's got it's got a fucking slash in the middle. I don't know. But yeah, Thirty Nine Smooth came out in nineteen ninety on Lookout Records. It was the only album they ever made with their original drummer John Kiffmeyer, also known as Al Cerrante. We will talk about him later. Um, and yeah, everyone at this point knows Green Day. Like, um, American Idiot, that one of the few bands I know that you can attribute two different albums to being, um, like, gateway albums for people. Uh, they've got American Idiot and Dookie, obviously, and, like, for two different generations as well. Excuse me, like, they're, what, ten years apart? And I was an American Idiot kid. Someone I know who's a couple of years older than me was a Dookie kid. You know? They are... A hugely influential band for many, many people, for many, many artists, for many, many different reasons. Um, and despite all the shit they get these days, I, th- I think it's you, you can't argue that they are not one of the biggest artists in music today. Um, despite, like I said, everyone is just always going on about how edgy it used to be. Uh, go find this album; it doesn't get much edgy than this. You thought Insomniac or Dookie was edge. Fuck me, listen to Kaplunk or 39 Smooth. Um, for Green Day, I've always felt kind of sorry for them because they are they always seem like they're in a never-win situation. Um, the output from American Idiot onwards is shunned by fans of Dookie. Uh, fans who were fans of... Fans, <laughs> people, fans who were fans of... That doesn't sound fucking right. Uh, Dookie to Warning, then shun, are uh, then shunned by people who are found a plump back because they prefer the indie days. It's all a bit of a mess. All of their different errors for the band are shunned by the previous one. That's basically what I'm trying to say. It was a really good point that I had written out in front of me and I still managed to fuck it up. But, yeah, their core fan base are just forever going off, off at each other. Um thus proving that music fans are the second worst fan base in the world, right behind wrestling fans, of which I am both. Uh, 39 Smooth was their full debut then. It came out, like I said, in April 1990, and the early body of work sounds about as debut album as you can get. It was reportedly recorded for 700 doll hairs, um, and with that, Green Day cultivated a raw punk sound that was so anti-establishment and anti-mainstream for the time. They then took that, blended it with the songwriting ability of Billy Joe that would soon become just phenomenally legendary. And yeah, off popped 39 Smooth and then eventually became Kaplunk. And then you had Dookie and Somniac, and even today, I, I still rate Revolution Radio. I quite enjoyed that. Uno dos tres, pretty poor, but no, I'll, I'll defend Revolution Radio. It was better than most, better than some, better than some. Um, but you got, for Third and Smooth, hits like um, going to Pasalacqua, which is a really fun word to say. It has all the on-the-sleeve hero worship of, say, the Ramones or Husker Du. That, like, Green Day are forever going on about how different bands have inspired them or, like, how they have influenced their sound. And, yeah, you can... It's very on-the-sleeve here with those, two, with those two as an example. Um... Blending that with enough melody and sing songness that would eventually see them eventually break through and become such a mainstream kind of band. The production in this, the very low production, it I found it both kind of helped and hindered Green Day because I think with that low production and everything, all the mixing is just mad. It gives them a bigger sound than just three lads huddled together 
in a basement, which is what the how this was recorded. They all recorded it in Mike Durant's basement at his house. Um, so it gives, does give like a bigger punk rock kind of sound, but at the same time, that low production does show off their drummer Al Bronte's shortcomings, which he he is quite repetitive. Like the reason why, although I really enjoy Thirty Nine Smooth, it's not a perfect album, and it's not one that is revered a lot by actual music reviewers. It's it feels quite fillery at times, and that's because. Whereas nowadays, I think Trey Cool is an incredible drummer, and I don't think. Well, I don't need to defend him. He just is. Most pe- like a lot of people will back that. I think I feel. Um, he can add. I'll talk to. I'll talk about him a little bit more later. But he adds like a bit more of a pep and energy to. Uh, the rhythm section of the band, whereas Sobrante was quite, you know, four four hi hat like just at different speeds um and his crash symbols like they just they occupy so much of the mix that you almost feel like the um like anyone who's actually into audio engineering like when you pop at the end of uh, your limits for like sound. That's why you, you have podcasters and radio guys who've got uh, pop shields to stop that happening. I feel like every time we hit the crash symbol, that was what was happening. And they're like, shit, shit, shit. What do we do? What do we do? Um, and yeah, it's just because he crash occupies that, and it's still largely the same throughout the album. It's just constant those like big crashy sound um, sounds happening. And like I said, having Trey Cool come in for Kaplunk onwards it gave the band a bit more of a boost in energy and just a bit more variety in the sound his fills are a lot better his just like general drum beats throughout the songs are better trey cool just a cool dude um i still really enjoy like i said 39 smooth um i said before it is not a perfect album it completely is not it is the result all the, I had a better word for it. We'll stick with result. It is a result of three teenagers. I think they were all seventeen when they recorded this. Three teenagers wanting to make music, um, and yeah, you can't really argue with that. I, it, it, the production is an issue, and it does sound quite fillery and repetitive. But when you've got songs on there, like Don't Leave Me, and I've already talked about going to Pasalacqua, I Was There has like one of the the earliest examples of those big sing-along kind of choruses. I really enjoy Road to Acceptance as well. I even really like Rest, which one of the reviews I read for 39 Smooth, they fucking shit all over it. I really like that song. How dare you? That's like gloomy punk rock. I can see why you would hate it, but I love that song. I hate you as well. Um, don't know who I, I can't remember who said it, so I can't really aim my bitterness, but you know, it's there. Uh, the Thirty Nine Smooth is quite difficult to find on its own. Now it's out of print completely, I believe. Yes. Um, it did get absorbed into the compilation album called 1039 Smooth Dance Sloppy Hours, which is 39 Smooth, 1000 Hours EP and Slappy EP, all just sort of like mushed into one. And go off and find that because it's also, as well as the album 39 Smooth, all the songs talked about a minute ago, it's also got 409 Your Coffee Maker, Knowledge, and I Want to Be Alone, which are also very, very good songs. Um, I remember finding this completely by accident because my dad's computer had, um, back in the golden years of torrenting, a thing that said new, like, Green Day album 2000, I can't remember what year it was, 11? When did they get a re-release? Or a remaster or something? We never got a remaster, I think it was, might have been 
Not really should on vinyl 2009. We'll go with that. 2009 New Green Day album. I was like, oh, fuck. How did I miss that? I thought it was just going to be 21st Century Breakdown. What the fuck? And then I started listening to what would actually be 1039 Sleep Without Happy Hours. And I was like, this does not sound like the Green Day I know. Did some reading about it. So, oh, it's their older stuff. Boo! Actually, I really, really enjoyed this. So, accidents make the best things. Just tell your kids. For, I try to find, like, modern bands to compare this to. Um, I actually found Swimmers, which has Billy Joe's son in it, to be a good comparison. Because it is, they do have, like, because they are indie they have an indie edge to the sound. It does sound kind of on the raw side, which is what I guess they've got a bit of an overlap between Swimmers and 39 Smooth. Um, pop as well, because they do go for like the low end kind of punk rock stuff. Excuse me. Also, Teenage Bottle Rocket, I think they are. Like a lot of the bands who broke the same sort of time as Green Day, like Blink 182, Sun 41, Offspring. Although they all had the same kind of sound at the, at the start, they've all sort of like split off differently i think offspring and green day are good comparisons for the current day but this was the 90s so it's a little bit different back then and i think teenage bottle rocker even modern day teenage bottle rocker has a closer end to the 39 smooth early green day kind of sound so yeah pop swimmers teenage bottle rocker if you like any of them these days Go back and give the first Green Day album a go. Even if you do only find the or only find find the one with more songs in it, um, one thousand thirty nine smooth out slappy hours. I think it's still worth your time. It's not perfect, but it's quite interesting to see where they came from compared to the fact that we know where they are now. Um, but yeah, that was thirty nine smooth. It was a debut album of Green Day. It came out in nineteen ninety, back when I wasn't even a thing. The good old days. Um, cool. So, from there, we will take a heck of a jump all the way to 2009. Ah, oh, what a glorious year. It wasn't. It was 10 years ago. We were all very old. The album is called Dig Your Own Grave, and it is by a band called Cars on Fire. They were from Bristol, and they play a very... Very cool, very likable iteration, a very melodic iteration of post-hardcore. They were one of the first super indie, undiscovered bands that I discovered and got into. I heard um, Burn the Suits, which literally opens with lead singer Ali Ross just screaming at you. Heard that on Scuzz and I just got hooked from there. I thought it was a brilliant song. Uh, Cars on Fire blend a very punchy iteration of post-hardcore with a lot of melody and a lot of hooks that you'd commonly find in alternative rock. So as a whole, expect aggro riffs, lots of shouting, all interluded with a harmonious melancholia, which I wrote down. Still not 100% sure what that means. Uh, yeah, like I said, the Burn the Suit, it opens the album and it just wastes no time getting the ball rolling. It just rips through you. Um, it's got a big chorus. It's got big pomp and circumstance kind of outro, which does get me hyped every single time. I am a big Ting fan of it all. And then, yeah, second track, Sharks, continues it all. And the, the front man in Sharks is not Ali Ross at all. It is the pounding snare from drummer... John Pick, and it's it's pretty good. It's pretty damn good. It's very... Dig Your Own Grave is very latter-day Ruben-like, in my opinion. It's got bags of power, but not enough that it will force it off telly. Um, you've got to find... I think it's one of the albums where overall it is quite an aggro album, but you do have the one song in there which can get you... TV time, which I think Ruben did towards the lower end, like um, Blame Thrower, Freddy Krueger, that sort of thing. They are great Ruben songs, but when you compare it to. I can't remember what that song's called. Deadly Ninja Assassin, there we go. I'm pretty sure I saw 
Deadly Ninja Assassins for the first time on TV or radio of some kind, as opposed to the other ones. I get to go back and find them because Deadly Ninja Assassin is a lot more radio friendly than Freddy Krueger, for example. Um, I think vocally too, Ali Ross and Jamie Lenman. I think there is a crossover because they can go from like the very intense kind of shouts to a very clean, very. I was gonna say cathartic. That's the wrong word. Completely, very relaxing, clean. I guess they are both very good vocalists for very different reasons, but they can also do the same thing as each other can do. They're very versatile in that way. And a part of me, I've been wanting to talk about this album for a while, but I feel like upon re-listening to it, it might be through Rose Tinted Spectacles. Because I remember falling in love with this release purely because it was so indie, it was so unknown, no one else knew about this band. Excuse me. Um, And it took me so long to piece together. Like, I had no money back when this came. I, I never have any money. Um, so I had to find it through YouTube and nefarious means. So it took me fucking ages to get the whole album together. I think it took me like best co- best part of like 18 months to find all the songs from it. Um, and yeah, it's just... Objectively now, it's good that it's a mini album or like an extended EP, whatever you want to call it. Because it is quite rinse and repeat. Um, it came out in 2009 where pop rock bands like Kids in Glass Houses, You Me at Six, Blitz Kids, Death Havana, like the four horsemen of the pop op, the pop apocalypse, the apocalypse. You know what I'm trying to say. I'm trying to make a pun. It didn't work. The bad people, the bad bands, of the bad men. Um, they were taking it turns just to victimize the vocal, um, the melodic vocal hook in choruses. Which I think retrospectively has damaged a lot of the love I had for the songs on Dicky Run Grave. Um, and just music from that time completely. The full follow up, so it's difficult if you want to consider it this the debut album or the next thing the debut album, but it's called Black Hearts and Bloody Hands. It came out in 2012. Does address that to a degree. Like the choruses have a bit more energy behind them. And even with like the collaboration with Charlie Simpson, you don't feel like it's as soppy as Dig Your Own Grave. And I was fully hyped for Cars on Fire, especially when the 2012 album came out. And I thought, cool, we're gonna help. I'm gonna see them, you know, go on up in the world. It's gonna be grand. It's gonna be like a band that I saw from the Minnows all the way up to fucking sub headline the second stage of download because that's where most bands go to now um them along with exit 10 who i also have big love for and they've crashed miserably so did the cars on fire they split up i think it was 2013 which ain't fucking fair like i said i love this album um ali ross like i feel like ali ross as a vocalist he's got very um individual sound not just like what he can do just like his own accent i guess is quite i can't think of the word it's quite noticeable i guess um he joined a super group with jason bold from uh he's in bullet for my valentine he made his fame with pitch shifter he's done all sorts he's a Busy man, that Jason Bold. Jason Bold and Owen Packard from Earth Tone 9 called Unleash the Kings. If you like Ali's vocals, go and find that because he does an excellent job on that as well. It's much more groove heavy metalcore kind of sound like that. This song, Saturday Night Hero, fucking slams. Holy balls. I'd say harder than Burn the Suits. And when you listen to Burn the Suits, you'll know it fucking slams too. Um, if you are a fan of Ruben, definitely check this out. I think there's a lot of um, overlap there. I found a band called Midgar, M-I-D-G-A-R. Also could fit the mold with Cars on Fire, as well as your code name is Milo. I 
your code name is Milo. It's a little bit softer side compared to Cars on Fire, but go for any of them. Ruben, Midgar, your code name is Milo. Go for Cars on Fire. Uh, the debut extended EP mini album, Dig Your Own Grave, came out in 2009. If you want something a bit fuller, and I'd say a little bit better, well, a lot bit better, actually, in retrospect. Black Hearts and Bloody Hands that came out in 2012. Get your fill, because then they disappeared forever. Selfish cunts. On to the final album of the week, and we are in the tens. Have we actually got a proper name for this decade yet? Either way, um... Whereas, like, Man of War and the Green Day albums had, like, two years separating them, even though it was a different decade. This is a different decade. Dig Your Own Grave came out in November 2009. This next album I'm going to review came out January 2010. There is two months between them. Ah, time. Aren't you great? I'm looking at Black Jazz by Shining, the Norwegian one, not the Swedish one. They are different, very, very different. Please don't get them mixed up. You might be sad or might be very happy. Who knows? Uh, Black Jazz was the fifth album from the Oslo natives called Shining, again, Norwegian. And came out in 2010 and the band, the genre associated with Shining is... It is called Black Jazz. This is the album that named their own genre that they made. Um, they come from a history of doing acoustic freeform jazz. They did that for the first three albums. On album number four, Grindstone, they started incorporating more hard rock elements into it, including uh, saxophonist Jorgen Munkerby moving into a bit of a vocalist kind of role as well. And then from there, from like a hard rock, jazzy sort of thing, they made Black Jazz, which is a culmination of industrial metal, black metal, death metal, and freeform jazz. It is a fucking cauldron, a witch's pot of ludicrous and batshit intense ideas. And it's fucking mad, and it's fucking beautiful. It is, like I said, it's a cavalcade of erratic musicianship, and metal intensity. Uh, it gets kind of difficult because I was about to say the madness and the damage done. There are two songs called the madness and the damage done. The first one is what I'm referencing. The madness and the damage done has a minute and a half long synth and blast beat solo, which just it's so maddening because it's a high pitched like siren, I guess, from the synth. With that just like machine gun blast of um, blast beat snare. It's just an attack on all senses. Like listen to it on headphones and you just get a headache. Which is probably not like the best review for an album. But you know, stay with me here. It gets, I mean the album gets better. I don't know if I do. Time will tell. Um, at the Bold time, this album sounds like Nine Inch Nails remixing Meshuggah. Very intense, very cathartic, extreme, proggy metal with just a vomit of industrial sounds and synth noises, which, oh, it's just, like I said, it's just a maddening affair and it's an hour long, so you just, you need to take a breath halfway through because it's just non-stop. Um, the like the time signatures on this album are like time signatures are for chumps, you know. Helter Skelter could easily rival the Dillinger Escape Plan for the like intense progginess about it, um, which is weird because although it is like all over the place, it still would not be something I would call mathcore, if that makes sense but could still challenge Dillinger. It's a weird mishmash. It's it's odd. I'm very scared. Um, the only song that really takes the, like, just lifts the pedal, well, lifts the foot off the pedal just a tidbit is Omen. The penultimate song is a very slow, it's a bit methodical, almost like a torture room soundtrack kind of song. 
Um, and it kind of reminds me of Ghost, which is like a modern dark wave industrial death metal. Um, is it a duo or is it just a fellow on his own? If it's a fellow on his own, he's mad as a box of frogs. If it's two of them, they're both mad as a box of frogs. But you get me. Um, yeah, it just reminds me of Ghost, but just with more sax. Take that as you will. Uh, it's very raw, and it's a very visceral album, and I don't think anyone could have done a better job of putting it together and fronting it and leading it than Jorgen Munkerby. He is a fucking saint. He is a extreme metal saint, and he does such a fucking good job. And I really, really like him as a musician and as a frontman. Um, his command over such a schizophrenic minefield of sound. Um, it's in a similar sort of way to Converge, where you know everything has had its very specific place on this album. It hasn't been like, what if we tried this or what if we do that? It's no this part has to be here. I want, that's got a seven second gap there. I want four pulses of a snare. And I want to have like what a single note of sax here, but then eight here, you know? He is just lord and commander of this chaotic barrage of sound. Um, and the incorporation of those sax solos that are found throughout the album it not only harks back to the band's free jazz free jazz origins, but it also adds just a mad layer to the music itself. Like, 2010 had black jazz. It also had a seismic consequence by Yakuza, which I reviewed um, about a month or so ago. This and um, Shining got infinitely more popular and infinite more... Excuse me. Attention than what Yakuza did. This got more attention than what Psy ever did. The um, are they Thai? The Thai um, extreme metal band, and their saxophonist in there, Doctor Mechanical. Like when they said, "Oh, this is our new saxophonist, saxophonist, whatever you want to call her." Like the promo they released was her playing the saxophone covered in blood, topless. And this is still regarded better and high, more highly than that. Intense saxophone-driven extreme metal is more popular than tits, apparently. Bloody tits at that. You know, what the fuck? What a mad world. I love it. It's just... And as a singer, Jorgen is just... He's just the best. I love his... You don't really hear it that much on black jazz, but... His natural, gravelly kind of singing voice is just, it's sublime. I, it's not overly clean, but you know it's got a little ruffle to it. Um, combine that with the horror movie screams, which are in abundance on this, and you've got such a, again, such a versatile, such a different kind of vocal attack. And, yeah, I just think it's fucking great. This album, Jorgen, the whole thing is just fantastic. I love Shining to Bits. The image they had at the time when this came out, I remember in the spread of Metal Hammer, you had Jorgen in the middle, all dressed in black, with like shaved sides, um, still had quite long hair. Looked like a model, I won't lie. He's a very, very good looking chap. But he was flanked by two people, still all dressed in black, but it's just their entire face was wrapped up in cloth. Or it, was, it wasn't cloth though, was it? It was like a blank mask that didn't cling to the face. It just sort of sat in front of it, but was still taut. It was very weird, but it's very, very off-putting. It's a fucking phenomenal image to have with your extreme metal band. Um... That combined with like all the artwork as well. It's not graphic and it's not like the rooty, splintered kind of death metal, black metal kind of font type. It's very, it's very modern, 
um, kind of logo, like with isometric shapes. And it's very, very, it's very simple in the grand scheme of things, but it's just so imposing. And it's just so quite intense in its own right. And yeah, I love everything about this band apart from bits we'll get that apart from animal i didn't enjoy animal so and i haven't really listened to the freeform jazz stuff but other than that yeah best band ever um it's not the most immediate album by any means similar to converge and um, you will need time with it um unlike converge though you can settle yourself in for that black jazz sound um so they made three albums of this nature before getting into Animal, which came out last year, which was... Mm. Um, so I would say work backwards. Start with International Black Jazz Society, which came out in 2015. Start with that because that was when they were incorporating a more mainstream metal note of sound that had sax over the top. Um, or like a mainstream pro prog metal, I should say, that had a sax over the top whereas this is extreme jazz i think is the best way to put it um but yeah they saw like went from this to a little bit more mainstream to a little bit more mainstream again like the catchiness of it all and having jorgen sing more as opposed to always scream so yeah, if you work back on some international black jazz society to 111 to black jazz i think that'll be a nice slow move into this like black jazz world and yeah ignore animal it wasn't very good if you like the modern output from ishan where he's got very expansive extreme progressive metal i think you'd really enjoy this version of shining if you like mains which is a norwegian like glitch electronica rock band um, which are like on the road, very fucking good. I love the mains album that came out. Was it last year it came out. Um, it's not as intense as Black Jazz, but that kind of idea of like maddening electronica with a metal sound, I think, crosses over well to Black Jazz. I think, if anything, mains maybe catches on more with Black Jazz, the International Black Jazz Society album from 2015, as opposed to this Black Jazz album, if that makes sense. Um, and if we're going to stick to just this album, Anal Nathrak, which Nathrak are oh, hell of a mo much more intense because they borderline grindcore at times, but the intensity of black metal, the industrial nature of the top, if you add a little bit more jazz and saxophone, you would probably not be too far away from a black jazz shining kind of sound. So Ishan, probably closest. Followed by Mains, then Anama Thrak. If you listen to any of them, go give Black Jazz by Shining a go. Remember, it's a Norwegian one. He's got the really pretty boy as a lead singer, not the Swedish one where it's got someone who likes to kill himself on stage and then pretend he's dead for a little while. That actually happened because black metal is mad. Um, and yeah, that is it for the, I guess, return episode of the Desolation Sounds podcast. Next week, I hope to have... I'm adding it up. Fuck off again. Jamie Lenman, Torelian Leone Rhapsody, and Royal Republic um, as my review albums. I will be doing news from today, which is Wednesday. The day it's going to come out. Today until next week. So anything I've missed the past few weeks, I won't cover. Um, the only thing I'll say is I'm very much looking forward to a new Hawkeyes album. There's a few songs released that I'm very intrigued by. And I was very sad to hear the passing of lead singer from Tengar Cavalry. The little bits that come out here and there sound like a tragic situation. And yeah, best of luck. And th I guess thoughts and prayers go out to anyone in this family and anyone associated with Tengar Cavalry. But don't want to um, gloss on it too much. Most because I've got like no right in saying it. Um, but now next week, Jamie Lenman, Torelli and Leone, uh, Rhapsody and Royal Republic. This week you've had Manowar, Kings of Metal from 1988, uh, Green Day with 39 Smooth from 1990, Cars on Fire, Dig Your Own Grave from 2009, and from 2010, the Norwegian Shining 
with Black Jazz. I hope you have all enjoyed it. It's been a pleasure to be back. And I look forward to talking to you all next week. Have a lovely week. Goodbye. <laughs>